Some time back, I was required to tackle this challenging 71-year-old gentleman with multi-system illnesses, steamy cornea, shallow chamber, and an intumescent cataract with recalcitrant glaucoma. He had a story to tell. He had undergone a macular hole closure with macular plug without gas tamponade and post-operative posturing. Herein, the posterior segment surgery went off uneventfully but for a gradual haziness of the ocular media till the surgeon noticed this after the surgery, an opening in the posterior capsule, a posterior capsular rent. The patient was restless during surgery and perhaps the posterior capsule was scraped at some point with the vitrectomy cutter. His vision improved to 660 from a preoperative level of 260 and the macular hole appeared to have closed in the OCT. His cataract appeared stationary during the first two postoperative months. However, subsequently, there was an accelerated progression. And in a week's time, it swelled up to an intumescent stage with an accompanied, medically uncontrolled IOP elevation. The B scan revealed an attached retina and evidence of lens matter behind the posterior capsule. He was scheduled for cataract surgery under guarded prognosis. The eye was softened preoperatively with intravenous mannitol. The corneal incisions were made. The anterior capsule was stained with tripan blue dye. We employed a modified soft shell technique with Viscoat and Helon 5, which flattened out the bulging anterior capsule. Obtaining an intact rexis is a paramount interest in a situation like this. While fashioning the rexis, we noticed a fluffy consistency of the lens matter and suspected the absence of nucleus in the back. Cortical cleaving hydrodissection is never performed in the presence of a suspect posterior capsule. Anticipating only fluffy cortical material in the bag, we went in directly with the irrigation aspiration and as we had expected, we soon confirmed the presence of the nucleus in the vitreous cavity. We revised our surgical strategy at this stage and decided on the table to clean up the anterior segment, implant an eye well in the sulcus and then go after the dislocated nucleus through the past manner route using the phragmatome. So we went in with the vitrector, used the irrigation aspiration cut sequence for the cortex and irrigation cut aspiration sequence for vitreous when presented. Though we didn't use it, trimcelone acetonite assisted maneuvers could have been considered at this stage. Once the anterior segment was cleaned up, we planned for a sulcus fixated 3 piece hydrophobic acrylic intraocular lens. The peripheral bag was collapsed with injection of a dispersive OVD under the iris and the leading haptic was carefully injected into the sulcus. The trailing haptic was compressed into the opposite sulcus. The optic was subsequently buttonholed posteriorly through the rexis margin. This optic capture strategy ensures long-term IOL stability. It is necessary to suture the wounds in the presence of a PC dent, more so when a concomitant pass planner procedure is performed. The lens was locked in place, very well centered, and one can see the cat's eye rexis due to the captured intraocular lens. Subsequently, we went through the pass planner and emulsified the nucleus and residual lens matter in the vitreous cavity. A small bubble of PFCL was employed to protect the disc and macula from falling lens particles during phaco fragmentation. At the conclusion of the surgery, the eye well was very well centered. The patient has been under regular follow-up and has a closed macular hole 
with the best corrected distance vision of 6x12. In conclusion, intraoperative instrument touch is a potential hazard in pass panel vitrectomy. The cataract surgeon should have a strong index of suspicion in the presence of rapid postoperative opalescence of the crystalline lens. Early intervention for the ensuing cataract may prevent lens induced complications, and it is desirable to take up these challenging cases as a multidisciplinary approach.